Amen, amen. Family, it's good to see everyone this morning. Uh, to stand back before you again, uh, I'd like to thank the leadership, my Uncle Charles, Brother Carbon, those responsible for allowing me to preach today. It's good to be here. It's good to see my family. I know I don't get to see them often, but I love you guys, and it's always, uh, it's always a joy to see you. Amen. All right, y'all, I got a lot to say, and I don't got a lot of time to say it, so uh, meet me in Matthew chapter 18. <laughs> Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21, and we'll read down to verse 35. And scripture says, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that they had and repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. One, and he seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went out and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what, he, what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you have not had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that he was owed. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from the heart. Uh, the subject this morning is must I forgive? I want you to make it personal. Must I forgive? This is not about anybody else. This is about you and God. Must I forgive? One of the first things that we teach our children as they are learning the English language is the ABCs. When we think about the ABCs now, it seems simple. I mean, we can rattle them off just like that. We don't have to think about it. It comes natural to us. It's second nature. Family, I submit to you that forgiveness ought to be the exact same. Same way. Practice it. It comes natural and it comes quick. So when we read Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18 is one big conversation. All right. And our text is taken at the end of that conversation, but we have to understand the first part of the conversation. The first part of the conversation comes with, uh, with two disciples and they say, Lord, we wanna be great. What, what do we have to do to be great? They want the right hand and they want the left hand seat. And then Jesus takes a little child and brings the child and said, unless you become like one of these, you won't even enter in into the kingdom of God. So when we talk about forgiveness, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end of the sermon, when we talk about forgiveness, we have to ask the question, what can a young, pure child teach us about forgiveness? Understand this is one big conversation, and these are elementary principles that God expects us to practice every single day. All right, so when we get back to verse number 21, Jesus had spoke to them about being humble 
and about, and about talking to your brother. If your brother offends you, go to him one-on-one. -on -one. Then Peter, leave it to Peter to always ask a question or to take a sporadic action. Peter says, Lord, how many times do I have to go through this process? How many times do I have to forgive people who are not sorry? How many times do I have to deal with people who really don't care that they have offended me? Up to seven times? Now you have to understand, in this culture, in this time, they were a lot like this, in this way. Now you gotta be honest, don't leave me up here by myself. We have some people in our lives that have offended us so much that we get to a point that we're just done. And in the Jewish world, they taught that you had seven strikes and you were out. And they would keep count, that's one. You talking sideways, that's two. You still bumping your gums, that's three. They would keep count. So Peter says, up to seven times, but there is no limit when you're dealing with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I say to you, not seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now for the smart folks in the room who only had to take math once, you can see that that's 490 times. Now that's still an issue because the human mind has a way of keeping count. Have you ever dealt with somebody and they can remember stuff that you forgot all about? They're remembering stuff from years and years ago. So no, it's not 490 times. So what does Jesus mean when he simply says, not seven times, but up to 70 times seven? Let me paint the picture. Five years ago, my wife and I, uh, we were first married and she was on fire for God. I mean, she was, she was blazing. And she said, hey babe, uh, I have two friends that you know life has been hard on them. Can they come live with us? Me trying to be, now I was young, I didn't, I didn't know about guidelines and boundaries when we first got married and letting people live to you. It was brand new to me. Only thing I saw, my wife is on fire for God. It'll just be a month or two. So I said, okay, sure. And when they got there, everything was great. We were having a good time. But slowly, they thought that they could just sit there. They were on their own timetable. At the time, I had to be at work at 4.30 in the morning. Now, if I leave at 4.30 in the morning and I come back home, I leave at 4.30, you sleep. I get off work and you sleep. Then you got the nerve to wake up and ask me what's for dinner. I started to get angry, but I said, you know what? We're gonna work through it. Now, keep in mind, y'all, I was young, girl, and I didn't know about boundaries and how you were supposed to set guidelines for people who are living with you. So time goes on, and still, they, they have a, this thing they want to sleep all day. So eventually, I said, you know what? You got to December 23rd to get out of here. I said it in love. You know, I was agitated a little bit. But then they began to treat us as if we had done something wrong. When the time came for them to leave, they stood before my wife and myself, and act like we had treated them like dogs. They were so ungrateful. And see, it's one thing for you to be mad at me and disrespect me. But if you want to see another side of me, disrespect my wife. I was angry. So they eventually they left. But it didn't stop there. See, I was angry. But then a week went by and I noticed something was missing. Another week went by, my wife says, my favorite book, some of the favorite dishes that I had, they're gone. Now, now family, hear me. We started finding and noticing that things were missing and a month had gone by. And now they are out of sight, they are out of mind, and guess what? My wife and I are the only two people even thinking about the situation. And we've become angry and possessed and dealing with our own sinful thoughts. So when Jesus says, not seven times, but up to 70 times seven, the reality is that we are human. And when people hurt us, a month will go by and you still feel it. Two months will go by and you'll still feel it. If you're really angry, a person can die. There are people now who are mad at dead folks 
and they can't live life, they can't enjoy holidays because they are angry at people who are no longer here. So when Jesus says seven up to seven times seven, he's not putting a number on it. He's simply saying the human heart has a way of remembering things. And guess what? When you remember things, you got to let it go. You simply, you have to let it go because if you do not let it go, it will destroy you. Have you ever met a bitter Christian? They're saved, they sanctified, they holy, but they mad. And sometimes they are so miserable. Yes, they know that baptism is essential for salvation. Yes, they believe that you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit after baptism. But the issue is they're angry. Who's going to listen to an angry person preach the gospel anyway? Family, the point of Matthew chapter 18 is this. These are elementary principles that you have to have down in order to be healthy because nobody wants to be baptized into dysfunction. These 12 men were about to change the world. In Acts chapter 2, you, we see that they've grown up a little bit, but they had to grow. They had to learn. These, you can understand all the doctrine that you want, but if you don't have the same heart as a child, if you're not forgiving, if you're not loving, if you're not humble, nobody wants to be a part of a bitter, confused group of people. And that's not just church. We're talking about families, too. This is personal on every level of life. We have to learn to forgive. But not only forgive, let it go. We have no right to handcuff mercy and suspend justice when Christ Jesus didn't take that approach with us. So we see that the first point in the first two verses, Peter asked a question, Lord, how many times? No, not seven, but we need to understand that it has to be a way of life. And we freely give it because it was freely given. All right, but it, it doesn't stop there. Jesus then proceeds to talk about mercy. See, forgiveness and mercy are not the same thing, but mercy flows from forgiveness. They're not the same, all right? Now, Jesus goes further, and he talks about a king. And this king was looking to settle his debts. And the king had a slave who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, family, imagine if someone came to you and you had a debt over $100 million. Can you imagine how your heart would sink? Just thinking about it, just, it sends me somewhere because there's no way we can pay it. There's nothing we can do. So there's a 10,000 talent debt, and that's well over $100 million in our day and time. But the guilty party, and here's another thing. You have to be careful dealing with people who want to escape consequences. This person really had, and I'll, I'll come back to this point later, but this individual had no real sincerity. But here's the thing, mercy and forgiveness is not based on their sincerity, it's based on your heart and your relationship with Jesus Christ. So we see in the text that this man owes the king 10,000 talents, well over $100 million, and he falls down on, falls down on the ground, he prostrates himself, and he starts begging the king. But notice what the king did. The king looks at him, and scripture says he has compassion. Now, family, understand that compassion is simply not feeling sorry for someone. Because we drive by homeless people on the street all the time, and we'll feel sorry for somebody and keep driving. We'll feel sorry for people, and we won't be moved to action. But this king, Reminds me of another king who came 2,000 years ago. He looked at a situation, and he looked at the man, and Scripture said he felt compassion. Compassion in the Greek, literally in this context, literally means that when he looked at the situation, he was moved. But not only was he moved, it paints the picture that his bowels started to shake. His organs on the inside started to move and tremble. He was filled with love to the point 
that he was physically affected, and that physical effect caused him to wipe out the man's debt. Family, when you are filled with mercy, mercy, and in this context, mercy for someone who has offended you, your forgiveness. I challenge the sincerity of your forgiveness because scripture teaches us that once you forgive somebody, mercy should freely flow. But let me say this, that doesn't mean you're a doormat. No, no, no. There's a difference between showing mercy and being foolish. Sometimes you can hear a text like this and you want to get on fire for God and you just start forgetting everything. No, boundaries are in scripture. Boundaries are in scripture, and there's nowhere in scripture where God says you got to be a fool about what you're doing or be foolish about what you're doing. So, no, there are still boundaries. But how do you set those boundaries? With love, with patience, and ultimately with forgiveness. You understand that you cannot hold that person or look at that person with a negative eye because you understand what Christ Jesus has done for you on a hill of Golgotha right outside of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So the point is this. The king looked at the situation and he understood what the man, he couldn't repay him. And he had mercy. I challenge you to show mercy. But here's the thing. When we show mercy, mercy is simply not out of mind, out of sight. A lot of times we feel like we have forgave someone. But the reality is they're just not in our vicinity. And you know how? When you see them again, all those feelings come rushing right back. They come rushing right back and you will find yourself in that very moment just as angry and just as hurt as when the offense first took place. So Jesus is teaching the first point. There's no number, there's no limit to forgiveness. The second point, if you've truly forgiven somebody who has offended you, it's personal, who has offended you, you should be willing to be merciful and to restore them if need be. It doesn't mean, and here's the thing, restoration doesn't mean that the relationship goes back to what it was. Hear me. It doesn't mean it has to go back because there are some things people do in life that you, you can't come back from that from a relationship standpoint. But we don't have to be hateful, bitter, and withholding God's love from them. See, it's about the heart. God cares about the heart. He cares about what's going on on the inside. All right? So those are the first two points. But notice what this individual did in the text. He receives mercy. But while he's down there crying, in his heart, he's also plotting and scheming. You got to be careful when you're dealing with people like that. He's on his knees, crying, plotting, scheming, and he goes to a fellow servant who owes him a few denarii. Family. A few denarii, what the text speaks of. You can go work at Home Depot, KFC, wherever and you can pay that debt off in three months. The point is the debt was only about three months worth of wages. This man, God, I mean the king forgave him of over a hundred million dollars. But this guy was so hypocritical that he cannot forgive 10 denarii, three months working at KFC. Do you see the hypocrisy was going on here? See, we have a tendency, and we're the same way. We have a tendency to think somebody else's offense is worse than our offense. Oh, after ours, ours is not that bad. However, God doesn't look at it that way. He looks at it mercy for mercy. If I show you mercy, who are you to handcuff mercy? This guy takes the man's family and this is the punishment of that time. Slavery, 
uh, in some cases was a, you had to repay a debt. So he takes them, he throws them in prison over a debt they could have repaid. But then hypocrisy soon caught up with him. Family, we have to understand, people watch how we live. People watch how we talk. People watch how we walk. And they know that if, God, if we claim all this good stuff about God, but our actions don't follow, that'll turn somebody away so quick. We wonder sometimes why we cannot grow collectively and individually. It's because we're walking in hypocrisy. This man threw a man in jail over a debt that he could repay. But notice what the king said. When the king called wind of this, the king came and got him and said, I forgave you of all that debt, you wicked slave. Why couldn't you do the same? See, notice how God looks at you when you walk in hypocrisy and you refuse to be merciful. He views you as a wicked person. Wicked. Wickedness is no different from those who are outside of the body of Christ. So God views you as a heathen, somebody who even though you may be in covenant with him, you may be baptized at that very moment, he looks at you as a wicked individual. The same as those who are outside of the body of Christ. So the king says, you wicked slave, and he throws him in prison. He and his entire family. It's another point you got to be careful. Sometimes your, your actions just won't cost you. Families have drowned because of the head of household couldn't get it together or the head of household was living in a hypocrisy. This man made a bad decision and it cost him everything. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, if you don't practice this, if you don't live like this, on the day of judgment, my heavenly father will do the exact same thing to you. See, it puts it in context for us. Some people feel like being baptized, being a good Christian, coming every other Sunday, giving every other month. They feel like that's good enough. But Jesus expects more. God expects more. He's not after some time. And I understand we have to grow. But God wants you to grow forward. Are we making progress? Are we making moves forward? Jesus tells them that if you don't forgive from the heart, if you don't set the point, let it go. Let it go. It doesn't mean that they've got away with it because vengeance is God's. Learn to leave godly things to God. Vengeance is not in our hands. And it's hard because sometimes forgiving individuals, it seems like they never pay. And then not only do they never pay, it seems like they always get a blessing. And that's on Facebook, Instagram, you see some wicked people and it just seems like, man, they're always winning. But they're wicked. They're evil people in our sight. But guess what? God looks at us the exact same way if we don't learn to love and forgive those who have offended us. So when we look at forgiveness, we see in verses 21 through 23, that it's not about, it's not about the number of times. It's about you being the type of person that God commands. You have to practice not letting the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, you do everything you can to settle a disagreement before your bed, before your head hits the pillow at night. Because if you don't, you give way to the devil. And have you ever not handled something and the more you think about it, you just get in a bad mood? I remember one time I was so mad at my boss and I'm driving to work and I literally talked myself up to high blood pressure between the house and the job because I was so upset. I was angry. Did I have a right to be upset? Yes. You shorted my paycheck. I had a right to be upset. But you never have a right to disobey God, regardless of what happens. 
So Peter helps us see, Jesus helps us see in verses 21 and 22 that forgiveness is unlimited. There's no number. Also, as we move through the text, the king helps us see that if you truly have forgiven someone who's offended you, if you have the chance to be merciful and you refuse it, you really haven't forgiven that person. All right? And then we see that God hates hypocrisy. God has forgiven us, and we have no right to handcuff mercy and not forgive somebody else because it will ultimately cost us eternal separation from God. But the last point, you remember I, in the beginning, now I told you that Matthew chapter 18 is one big conversation. And the conversation starts with Jesus taking a young child, sitting them on the, his lap, and teaching them about the kingdom of God from the perspective of a young child. So that means every major conversation in Matthew chapter 18, a young child can teach you something about it. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what can a young child teach us about forgiveness? When you come to a young child who hasn't been soiled by the world, who still has a pure heart, you can offend them. And a Snickers later, a bag of chips later, whatever snack you got later, they'll be laughing. They'll be playing with you. There's a joyful innocence with a young child where you can offend them. You may even see the tears of innocence. But 15 minutes later, they've moved, not for 15 minutes, but for 15 years. 20 years, we'll hold on to it for forever. But a child, and notice this, these principles in scripture is God's way of freeing you. There's no prison that I have hated more than the prison of bitterness. There's no prison that broke me as a man than not being able to forgive those who have hurt you. So a child teaches us, a young child who hasn't learned how to lie like their parents, a young child who is still pure in heart, they will forgive quickly. And that's the point. If you are going to, and, and, and the disciples who would be future apostles, this is something they had to understand and they had to realize because they were going to start the church. And if you've ever been a leader dealing with church folk, you can't afford to go to bed mad because Monday morning brings a whole nother set of problems when you're dealing with God's people. Now, I don't say that as an insult, but it's just a truth. It's the truth of the matter. There's always something. And they had to understand you cannot hold on to that bitterness, to that anger, because I won't be able to use you for the kingdom. He says, the kingdom of God is like, and he tells this parable. Family, all of you might not be apostles. Man, no, let me take a, nobody's an apostle. It came out wrong. They were apostles. But the point is, you might not be in leadership, might not be preaching, you might not be teaching, but God can still use you. God has given everybody a gift. But guess what? You will never be able to use that gift if you do not practice what Jesus says about forgiveness, it's impossible to work for God and be angry. Now, I understand that we're human and there is a such thing as righteous anger because you see it when Paul and Peter got into it. Peter started acting like a hypocrite and started being racist towards Jews. The Bible says that Paul got so angry and he withstood him to his face in Galatia. But that's different than the anger that most of us deal with. We deal with offense, and guess what? We make every offense about us. You've done this to me. We make it personal, but guess what? What if God held that same standard with you? We'd all be guilty men. We all would be guilty, and there would be no hope, 
and we would all be condemned to eternal judgment. So family, we all have a long road ahead of us. And it's going to be hard. But we have to learn and practice forgiveness because God can't use an angry person. He can't use an angry person because guess what? When God decides to use someone, that individual has to know that when you are dealing with the flock of God, when you're dealing with God's sheep, people are going to offend you. People are going to hurt you. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And when it comes, can you just give it to God and let God take care of the rest? God expects us to guard our character. He'll guard our reputation. He'll guard our other problems. But it's up to us to guard our own character. Now, family, those of us who are in the body of Christ, you may be struggling with, with forgiveness, and that's okay. But today is a new day. If there's a conversation you have to have, today is a new day. But I encourage you, when you go to have that conversation, remember what Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago on a hill far away, on Calvary. Remember what he did. It doesn't mean that they weren't wrong, but it takes the, <clears throat> it takes the fire, it takes the personal, it takes it out of the conversation and you come in love and you learn to forgive like Christ has forgiven you. There's no big sin that, oh, just can't be forgiven. Relationships might not be restored, but you don't have to be bitter and you don't have to be angry about anything that's happened. Because if you do, Scripture teaches us right here in verse 35. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. These consequences are eternal. It's not about earth. These consequences are eternal. And you have to ask your question, is your soul worth your anger? If it is, keep going. But I guarantee when you die, you're going to instantly regret it. God has made a way. Take your burdens to the cross. God will give you the strength. Will it be easy? No. Will you shed tears? Probably. But with God's help, we can all turn it around. If there's anyone here today who's not a member of the body of Christ, you've heard the word of God, you know that Jesus came and died for your sins. Do you believe it? Are you willing to confess the greatest name amongst mortal tongue and be buried in the watery grave of baptism? If that is your wish, come now as we stand and sing.